the idea for this panel is to talk about the current state of edtech in Nigeria and Africa as a whole. And um, how this is going to work is we have 30 minutes to talk and 15 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, so we'll just get right into it. And this question is open to everyone on this panel. Um, most of the educational sector in Nigeria and Africa is still very traditional. Uh, and you guys are at the forefront of the sector. So um, what is the future of education from where you guys um, stand or sit as the case is? Um. Uh, Anu, thank you very much. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to be here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Toyosi Akirele Ogunshiji. Um, and uh, I work for Rise Networks, um, which is Nigeria's um, leading data science-powered learning, research, and work readiness center. Um, we own PassNowNow.com. Um, PassNow is about seven years old now. And it's perhaps uh, the most used, most visited ed tech platform um, in the entire country. Our users are in about 33 to, out of uh, 33 states of Nigeria, and about 65% um, of our users are students. About 25% are, about, are teachers, and the rest of that um, are parents. Um, Anu, you asked a very important question about what do, how do we foresee the future of education yeah. in Nigeria. Um, my answer to you would be that the future of education is dependent on our politicians. Um, it, it, would only go, <laughs> it would only go as far as um, the political framework of Nigeria prioritizes education. And I was just sharing with my brothers in the holding room before um, we came out to have this conversation that if you go to, EdTech is only going to prosper to the extent that the entire Nigerian system begins to rethink the process of investing in education or the process of designing our education framework. I feel like the Nigerian education system teaches young people to memorize rather than teach them, train them to perform. So what you have is a system that teaches people to simply cram and you know, regurgitate rather than train them to perform. So we prioritize knowledge above skills. That's number one. Number two, um, I spoke at the Global Education and Skills Forum in Dubai in March this year. And on that panel, we had the Minister of Education of Ghana. Ghana gives 20% of its national budget to education. Kenya gives 27% of its national budget to education. Nigeria gives 7%. 6%, thank you. So that naturally shows you what the attitude of, our, of we as a country. When you look at, and by the way, the Global Teacher Prize was, was won by a Kenyan teacher called Peter Tabichi, who, who teaches in a community called Kibera in Kenya. He donated 80%. I was right in the room, shedding tears. When President Uhuru Kenyatta called into that hall that night to wish Peter Tabichi well, what am I trying to say? The Nigerian teacher, Soji Mekbawo, who qualified as top 50 of the Global Teacher Prize, meaning that he's one of the top, the best 50 teachers in the whole world. So, Soji went to the MMA2 airport, the international airport of Nigeria, with the Ghana Must Go Back by Okada. Since he came back from that program, I've been trying to get, I, I've been trying to get one policymaker in this country, whether the senator of his constituency or his governor, not to give him money. I will fund the trip to Akure, where he comes from, in Ondo State. But let the governor just say, Nigeria, Ondo State is proud to have the best teacher. One of the best 50 in the world. Nobody. So, when you think about what the private sector wants to fund, how many times have you submitted a brilliant proposal that has to do with education or the future of work to a private company, whether it's a bank or a telecoms company or whatever, and they got priority? Turn on your TV stations, all of them are showing music, rap, and whatever. And, like I said, I was speaking to the MD of a bank the other day. I said, you, you need to sponsor this program we're doing on the fourth industrial revolution. And he said, oh, Tosi, you know, these things, we would rather do all these entertainment programs because this is what young people like. And I said, well, just prepare that in the next 10 or 15 years, your bank is going to be run by illiterates. 
and he shook. Why? Because I allowed the reality to hit him in the place that matters. You are a bank MD. You, when people are closing at 7 p.m., you are just resuming work because you have to do all of the work because the Nigerian education system teaches young people to simply read and regurgitate rather than to apply themselves to problem solving and critical thinking. So when you ask me what the future of Nigeria's education looks like, it depends on a, a few key factors. The most critical stakeholders are the government. When you have the government at the forefront of a conversation, prioritizing education, prioritizing teachers, when, when you're having an event like this and the Commissioner of Education does not think that it's too big to be sitting here learning and taking notes about what the government should be doing as policy for the government, then, you, then we begin to have a conversation. When you have an event like this and you have the Minister of Education who we only hear about on Twitter but we have never seen. Alright? I only see his picture in the newspapers. I've never seen him. I don't know what it looks like. All right? When we start to have those conversations, when the private sector of Nigeria begins to think that education is a fundamental, you know, pivotal part of our national development, when we are not afraid to dedicate an entire event to EdTech, like Tech Cabal has done, can we celebrate Tech Cabal for this? Because many times, people are afraid to run away. They don't want to have a conversation about education. They give us one panel in an entire day's event. But they would rather do fintech for three days because that's where money is. They would rather do energy, oil and gas and technology for five days. Some will do one for a whole week. So when you commit an, an entire event to education, then at least you are sure that you, you... I mean, we know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. So that future that you define is a future where illiterates are going to take over the system, where first-class graduates are going to come out and become intellectuals, second class graduates are going to come out and become entrepreneurs and employ the first class graduates, third class graduates are going to come out and become politicians and employ the second and first class graduates. School dropouts are the ones who get past. We come out, become area boys, and then rule all of us. Um, so, okay. Uh, um, to um, Dr. Tuzi, so um, we have this thing we say at the office that um, regardless of how much innovation you do, you cannot um, engineer your way out of bad government. So she has spoken extensively about bad government. But someone in the private sector, uh, how are you uh, trying to move the needle and improve the um, state of education in Nigeria? Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for being here. <clears throat> My name is Tunji and I run Giddy Mobile. Um, we're a learning platform. We're a learning company. And we have two brands, Gilmo and Elena. And um, I think one of the um, first things I'll say is um, many people in Edu are driven by passion. <clears throat> we, um, Gilmo Bile is seven years old now, or eight, almost eight. And one of the things I've learned the hard way is there's a huge difference between a social problem and a business opportunity. So when you say... Um, being in private sector, what are you doing about, how are you managing to push the needle in education? You have to know exactly what are you exactly trying to do. So um, am I trying to sell a product that pushes the needle for one or more of the stakeholders? Or am I trying to um, you know, make an impact on policy or on one or more of the stakeholders? Am I trying to do all? Very often you may find in your company you have a product, you have a, um, advocacy, you have a whole lot of stuff going on. So I would say that um, in my company we have chosen to be very, 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 very specific. Um, one of the biggest things I think about EdTech is business model. With your business model, you need to know exactly who your customer is, exactly who, who the stakeholders are. You're going to find that the person using your product may not be the person paying for your product, may not be the person benefiting from your product. And um, you have your product model has to be able to cater to all these kind of people. So sometimes <clears throat> you leave the social problem behind because you're like, I don't have the resources to deal with this now. I need to stay alive. So I think my, my, my overall answer is you need to know what you're doing. 
and one company is not going to transform the educational sector. You may be, let me not say a company, an institution that is an advocacy institution. If that's what you are doing, that's what you are doing. You may have a little bit of one or more or the other, but fundamentally, stick to your, not stick to, know who your product is for. Your product user, beneficiary, is your number one best friend. That's the person that must love you. That's your future. And then, the stakeholders of your users. I could give multiple, let me just give one quick example. We have, um, the product we've been doing longest is senior school product. It's called the SSP, Gidmo SSP, senior school program. We have um, onboarded about um, 390,000 learners in the past five years. Part of it white label, part of it branded. And um, we have a feature on that program whereby it's gamified. So there are 13 kingdoms. You have to conquer the 13 kingdoms in order to cover your um, um, YX syllabus. And every week when you learn and hit your learning goals, your battle or training goals for the week, you get one gigabyte of data, right? So, and if you don't hit your goals, you don't get one gigabyte of data. And that was a feature that the learners gave us because I went to a school, I was talking with the kids and trying to convince them about saying, I have this product, it's very, very good. You know, what should be the price? You guys like it. The first thing they told us, it's two years ago. Oh, the, it's too expensive. I said, why? They said, because it's the same price as Expo. Did you know Expo has price? <laughs> I didn't know in those days. I'm going to wrap up with this. And I was like, eh. and they said, yes, because Expo, they make it in YAC office or SSE office. It's original. You're on, you did it in your office. We like you, but it's not the same thing. But then the second thing that I said is, okay, even if you get the price right, you know, what you can do is, if we ask daddy for money for data, he will say, go and read your book. So, but if we ask him for money for your app, then you give us the data. Everything will work. So just put the data aside and we will get it. We'll get the money for you. And it's been a very, very successful feature. And the point I'm just making is you must know who your learner is, your beneficiary is. If you get close to them, they'll tell you what to do. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and um, for you um, at EdBest, um, what you do is you automate a lot of school processes. And so I'm wondering, for people who don't know what Edvest is and how, like, what was the light bulb moment that you thought, okay, we need to start automating school processes and what's the, what has the adaptation been like? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Dimeji Falana. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Edvest. I'm a full-stack software developer. Uh, at Edvest, uh, we automate school operations to create collaboration platform for school administrators, teachers, and um, parents so that they can track learning outcome and know the students that have tendency of uh, falling behind and there are so many other uh, things in between we do. So uh, as of this morning, we've automated successfully 483 schools in 17 states. Uh, the why for us is uh, majorly on what we have discovered around the education, which we know that uh, the first thing, uh, according to what she said, is to get the government to actually invest, invest and create the right policy on education. But the second thing, boy, is around the culture within the school. So we discovered that in Africa, about 30 teachers, I mean, about one student, one teacher stay in front of 30 students every business, every business, averagely, including private schools. So since we play in the, pri uh, the, the primary and secondary schools, so we focus on that and we discover that these teachers, uh, a lot of things depend on them because if you look at education globally, even the countries that have gotten it right, they depend largely on the right teachers to actually get results uh, and the culture around education, talking about Singapore and Finland, uh, so we, we actually decided to say, okay, if these teachers have so many uh, workloads, like uh, paperwork around what they do, because they will have to do attendance in every day, they have to do lesson notes every day, and these are time consuming. I was in one of the top schools uh, about three days ago, and one of the teachers told me that, uh, Dimeji, if lesson notes can be out of the way of teachers, then teaching job will be much more better because they have to write it every week, you know, all those things. And some teachers are very lazy. They just copy the whole 
lesson notes, and then they teach the student the same thing. Every so we built the system to actually reduce their workload, so that uh, even we of recent we are uh, use uh, an algorithm to actually rank content for teachers uh, that are creating lesson notes. So averagely, maybe it takes about three to four hours to create lesson plan for the week. So on our platform, using your own template, it takes less than 30 minutes to actually create it, and you are going to get content that is actually in line with what you want to teach. So what we focus more is actually our innovation has been around the teacher standing in front of the student every day because that's very, very key. And also to ensure that the administrators are carried along and then the parents can also track the learning outcome because that's actually the key. So talking about the future of uh, education in, in Africa, I think uh, after the government, it boils around the teacher because I, I still believe that uh, we cannot actually code the teacher out of the way of education in this century. Uh, honestly, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of uh, ed, tech fan, uh, ed tech companies trying to code the teacher out of the way, but for now, it's still not working because it's very important. Because the teachers know the pedagogy, they know the curriculum, they know all we just need them to do is to actually change some behavior in teaching, to improve behavior in teaching, and we can get things going. So that's why we focus more on the teacher, that if the teachers can actually get it right and the administrators, then education will move to the next stage. And already, we have been seeing some change in behavior of technology used by the child. The future is actually within changing the culture of how the teachers teach uh, and depending on technology with a lot of support for the teachers. I believe we can get uh, a lot of results. I hope everyone is getting their questions in, um, because we're going to take questions from the audience. And um, Tayo from Ubuntu Geek. Um, so what's interesting is that you have content that kids can watch um, to learn. And I'm sure it's something pretty much everyone in this room would have appreciated when they were growing up. Because it's something that kids love, like watching cartoons, and then they can learn from it. So like, what are the Nigeria adaptation money that you at Ubongo and basically what's the general idea behind Bongo Kids. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. I'm really um, happy to be here. How many of us remember Sesame Street? I hope I have the right age group here. <laughs> Sesame Street, anybody? Yeah. Big Bird, Ernie, yeah. Cowboy X. Yeah, okay, so apparently there are some post Sesame Street uh, people here. But that's okay. Um, basically, Obongo Kids is an edutainment company. What we do is we're providing localized, relatable, entertaining educational content for Africa's children. We like to say we have the largest classroom in Africa because, I mean, every week, over 14 million children watch our content across uh, about 11 countries, seven languages. Um, my job, my role in Nigeria is to provide the Nigerian child the opportunity to engage with this content. We start with, we work with the platforms and the technology that exists already for them. So we start with low tech, basically radio, TV, and then we convert them over time to interactive SMS and even onto apps and also digital self-learning platforms. So we take them from low tech to high tech. A lot of what has been said, I mean, you know, broadcast is the point that you cannot you don't exist, even as a tech company, in a vacuum. There's, lo there's a lot about the infrastructure, the attitudes, the mindsets, the policies, which will impact you. Um, yeah, and I think that um, as a business, like um, Dr. Adibeson said, you must evolve a business model that will allow you to survive, grow enough to impact. Um, for me, I think the key point that I'm going to um, throw out is that beyond um, the business model, we must also recognize that Sesame Street was sponsored by the government for over four decades. Let that sink in. And it was extended even outside of the US to Nigeria, and lots of us here benefited from it. Um, we must, but it was also a partnership between the private sector and the public sector. And it was a platform that was creative and was measured. So the impact was measured and they consistently showed the impact of their intervention. So whereas it was within the ed tech entertainment space at the time, um, 
the point here is, whilst we are passionate about education, we must begin to measure our impact and demonstrate our impact. Um, you know, facts don't lie, and our argument will become stronger when we show the impact of our interventions. Obongo Kids delivers between 10 to 24 percent improvements on learning outcomes, which means that a child that watches our content um, goes to school and does a approximately 10 to 24 percent better than his peers who have not watched our content. And that is measured. We continue to measure it across Africa in our spaces. This is important because if we are to engage policymakers, we must be engaging not on the basis of sentiment, but on the basis of facts that cannot be, that cannot be countered, yeah? Okay. That cannot be dis dis disputed. Um, the other thing is also, as adaptation manager, what I am doing also is bringing content that is globally available and localizing in Nigerian languages, Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa. A lot of the tech um, community um, focuses on Lagos and focuses on, you know, one language. What I have found, and for me it's a revelation, is that there's a huge, there are huge markets outside of Lagos, outside of English, outside of, you know, the narrow space that we have confined ourselves to for the moment. So let's think about moving out to Hausa. Hausa, we launched Hausa this quarter. We have opened up an additional about 11 million potential reach just by moving into Hausa. And we're, we're, we're now available across three countries. So the impact is not even limited to Nigeria. So the point is, uh, yes, there's a lot that infrastructure deficiencies, you know, a lot of limitation by infrastructure deficiencies, but I think there are also creative ways that we can grow our impact, grow our business, demonstrate the value that we bring to society. Yeah? Thank, Thank you. you very much for Thank that you. answer. Um, so we're quickly running out of time, so one last question for everyone before we get to the audience questions. And um, so as you said something about fintech, how fintech is basically the hot cake right now. So as people in edtech space, how do you convince investors to put money into a process that is not, if you are looking for instant gratification, you cannot get it from education. So how do you convince people to put money into something that does not bring instant gratification? Quickly. Okay. One of the things that I, <clears throat> I've always thought about, you know, in our work in tech around Nigeria specifically, is I feel like Nigeria has more businessmen than we have statesmen. And I say this because for every single day I walked around the corridors of Harvard University Kennedy School of Government while I was taking my master two years ago, there were families in America that had endowed $200 million on Harvard University so that children of America in the next 20 to 50 years can attend the most prestigious institution in the world. Like these were people who made money out of this country and are putting the money back in education. These are people who think that education is what built systems like this. In Nigeria, We've got a lot of businessmen who, you know, wank on their listings on Forbes and how, you know, how much, I mean, it's, it's like a competition between the rich people, amongst the rich people, in terms of how much, who has more money and who has more of a Lamborghini and in terms of material acquisition, rather than prioritizing what you think will be the, will build a long-term social impact on the country. Um, what I also wanted to say is we who work in EdTech need to uh, have a mindset that, while I agree with you, um, Dr. Tunji, I think that what we need to do as a sector is to break the commercial side of our work and the social side of our work. Because you would need money to, when people walk up to you to say they have a, a need or a deficiency, they don't, they don't expect motivational speaking. They expect you to dip your hands in your pocket and bring out some money. So... In trying to, I don't think, I think the work that has to be done is the reorientation of us as a people. Because whether you like it or not, the decision making, it's not only individuals who can invest in education. 
The decision-making processes in private sector rely on individuals like you and me, the marketing managers, the brand managers, who believe that my kids are going to go to school abroad, so it doesn't matter if the private or the public schools in Nigeria are fixed. However, what you need to let them know is your kids will go to school abroad. Like, I spoke to, <laughs> I spoke to the head of corporate governance of an oil and gas company two days ago, and she said, oh, my son is studying artificial intelligence in a university abroad. And I said, well, you know he's not coming. You, are, you know you've lo your son is never coming back. Because I don't know the companies that are already embedding. We own the first artificial intelligence worker in this lab in the country. And I know that AI and data science are still very nascent in Nigeria. So if, you are study, if your son is studying AI, except he's coming back to get a bank job or something, I don't know the systems that are already you know, built to absorb talent that have in-depth knowledge of AI, data science, machine learning. Even though in other countries, you're already building these new methodologies. If you, if you even look at the World Economic Forum rankings in terms of, in, you know, increasing jobs and declining jobs, the world's highest paid jobs are in the realm, are in the spaces of data science. However, Nigeria is not, we're not even scratching the surface. So I think that it's more than just wanting to target individual investors to come and uh, put money down. And you need to also let them know that education is not like every other business. It won't generate your ROI for you in return. But you need to see that you want to be the Sonny Vaki of Nigeria. Sonny Vaki is the biggest education philanthropist in the world. He owns the largest chain of K-12 schools in the world, GEMS Education. He's the one who endows the Global Teacher Prize with $1 million every year. That's a businessman. But you need statesmen who understand that you don't need to focus on the next election. You need to focus on the next generation. And we don't have such people with such mindset here. I also think that one of the things that we, the EdTech people, are not doing very well is that we're not telling our stories as well as the other, the FinTech folks. Whether you like it or not, PR, you know, plays a key role, and marketing plays a very key role in this space. And people look at fintech as something where I can use my mobile app to transfer money. But if you are a university graduate or a young professional who doesn't have any younger one in secondary school or primary school anymore, you don't feel any sense of a strong connection to paying attention to whether our primary school education or secondary school education is fixed. You're seeing it as simply something where if you have your means of sustenance, you'd simply be, be able to, um, you know, figure out how your kids will go to school. So I think, number one, um, storytelling is very important for EdTech in, in Nigeria. Uh, number two, I think we should move on from targeting individuals as investors who can put money down to making sure that we're targeting the champions within the industries, across industries. Um, Seplat, for example, spent $65 million dollars on, you know, CSR last year, and most of it was in STEM education. I also think we, we focus too much on going to the same people. Every time you're writing a sponsorship note, it's going to MTN, the banks, and all. Um, IHS Towers spends all of their CSR money goes to education, and it goes to STEM. But, you know, if we don't do our homework and do this research, you won't find the money. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so this question is for you, Imeji. Um, it's from audience member and they say, are the teachers happy about the automation process and how often do they get trained? Uh, you know, to be frank with you, uh, not all the teachers in every school at the first instance love to automate processes because, uh, you know, a lot of teachers still believe that this is going to give me more work because they haven't tried it before, you understand? But what amazes me most of the time is that I have seen teachers that in the first instance, maybe when they're even taking decision to buy, they are telling the school director that, I know this is not going to work and this and that. And you discover that it's because they've never touched a mouse before. So when they discover that uh, all I just need to do is to prepare my lesson plan, teach, and I can key in the score and then the report is ready, for grading, and I don't have to press calculator, I don't have to divide to get the position of students, I don't have to say, I'm waiting for math teacher, I'm waiting for this. So it gives them some kind of, oh, okay, so this is, this can actually work, okay? So I, I wouldn't say teachers jump at EdTech. 
I will say teachers love a tech when they are encouraged to actually touch it and actually get a value from it. So, but what we're trying to do to actually promote that is to, you know, we have a program called Edvest Catalyst. Every year we gather, last year we gathered about 1,600 uh, teachers and uh, school owners, and next year we're going to gather about 3,000. So we use this program to actually uh, showcase and show teachers with different case studies to say, in your classroom, you know, last year, uh, this year we showcased a mobile, new mobile app that we are just releasing that can actually help using computer vision to take attendance in the classroom. So how, what the teachers should just do is just to use the app to take the picture of the class and then the system will recognize the face of the student and mark the attendance. So when the teachers hear this, they're like, oh, so we, we're not going to do Abolaji Rashid present. So it, it, it amazed them. So we're trying to show them more by this is a case study, this is the kind of result you can get, and these are the schools that are currently using this. And uh, the, you know, the, the behavior is changing uh, gradually. But I believe we can get more results uh, if we do more uh, in that, on that area. Yeah. Uh, and and concerning the training, we, we have a video training, then we, you know, we, even sometimes we physically go there. Because sometimes you have to do some real-time, one-on-one training for these for teachers, for, for it to actually work. That's why when you see some, 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 some schools, we buy some solutions. I don't, I don't, have you ever been to a school that they have interactive board, they have computer, but they just cover them because the person that knows how to use it is no longer in the school. <laughs> they buy so many things because they don't know how to use it. Computer teacher has left, and the next person has not been trained. So there's something we do every, every academic calendar. We, we reach out to the schools to say, have you changed your teachers? Have you changed anything? Then we go there to retrain them, and then we also use an online medium to actually train them. Uh, and that, and that's, why, that's why we've been able to scale that number. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and um, for, Ty, for, for you, Tayo, um, a lot of technology is very Lagos-centric. And um, as Nigeria Adaptation Manager at Ubongo, Ubongo Kids, how do you ensure that um, there's a, an even better spread of what you're doing outside of the bubble that is Lagos? Yeah, okay, so I, I'm just back in from two weeks in Kano. Yeah, um, managing the adaptation of an entire season of one of our, our shows into Hausa. In Kano, um, I saw more activity, uh, what's it called, Black Friday activity, than I see in Lagos. So the data to support what you just said, do you really have it, or is it just an assumption? It's mostly an assumption. And Thank the you. Fact so let's check the data, that's here. what I'm saying. I don't have the data right here, but from just my own deep stick, I mean, in the, right there, my translators were buying stuff, yeah? Ope just launched in, in Kano, and Kekena Pep is the biggest hit because it comes to you. By culture, their women are not supposed to share. So it's just a perfect fit for them. So you see, the use case changes with culture. It changes, the dynamic changes um, with culture, with location. I think what tech needs to do is invest in going out of Lagos to understand the culture. Your use case will be different in this market. But if you invest, you will uncover what I call nuggets of gold that can be refined, yeah? Um, we launched on SVOD, streaming video, and under two weeks, three weeks, we, we thought we were launching for diaspora, but the illiterate man in Kano is ready to pay $5 for his children to watch everything on his phone. By culture, they don't go out, so they need entertainment, so they are even more. So you see, the point I'm making here is the technology is, is not, it's not limited by geographical barriers. So what has limited tech is an understanding of culture and languages, which is what I do, which is I extend um, content and platforms into new cultures, new languages within Nigeria. So that's, it's the mindset change that I think, you know, the, the ed tech scene needs to um, adopt, yeah? And um, the final question for this panel is for you, doctor. Um, someone says they live close to the slum and most of the kids around have parents working way below minimum wage, which, presents, which prevents them 
from being able to access EdTech services. So what is being done to help these class of people? Okay, um, I think a line connecting everything everybody has been saying is really it's very, very important to know the difference between a business and an NGO. And you may house the two in the same innovator's head, but they're two different things. So maybe I am this passionate person and I just want to change the world. I'm running a company, I'm running a movement, I'm doing stuff, but in reality, that may be two organizations or three or four or my personal activities. So I think the, and just before answering that, I'll quickly jump to the thing of FinTech. I think that if you understand that you're running a company, at least the company aspect of your activity, then anybody who is investing based on buzzwords is not even an investor you need in the first place. And I don't know any other sector outside EdTech where you can achieve profitability so fast at low scale. Because if, I'm, if every lesson teacher who on his or her own is charging 20 or 30K, can be profitable at that business model scale. So if you get the business model right, there's a business model that is for 1,000 people, there's a business model that is for 10,000 people, there's a business model for a million people. You need to get the business model right, and then the funding will come. In our, I can tell you that, for instance, in my company, we've been in Exodus, in Mount Sinai, all over the place for the past two, three years, but it's looking like we're going to do six or seven hundred percent growth next year because we clicked something and that thing once you just press it, it started going but you can spend forever trying to find that thing and so from that point of view i think you have to know what are you trying to do so when the question is what is being done to help this class of people by who right so um what is being done by the government i could ask the government and the question is, is my own company trying to do anything for those class of people? We, our business model is a scale business model. So we're looking for five to 10 million kind of people business model. And so my own company is definitely interested in those people. So the products we develop are products that shouldn't cost more than $1 a month. So for me, when I am building my product, I'm thinking of someone who can pay 360 naira a month, which in that case would cater to this kind of people. Perfect. But if you just say ed tech, there's an ed tech $500 product, $100 product, $1 product, you need to know. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, that's all we can take for this panel. Uh, thank you very much.